Hi there, uh, Chris Orwinter from TFGM. Hello. Um, one of the things that's come up from all, all the uh, presentations has been the importance of data, understanding what fleet operators are doing, where they're going, why, and when. Um, and you know the need for data to understand that and then some of you have demonstrated that actually getting hold of that data or using that data is very tricky due to commercial sensitivities uh, and you know other other concerns GDPR perhaps what I want to ask the panel and I think it applies for all of them is can they see a roadmap to some kind of national or regional database where that, that information is available, either for um, operators to share them amongst themselves to be more efficient, or just so that authorities can actually better understand what's going on on their road network? Yeah. Um, I'll start first. So I would say there is a roadmap towards this um, in this simple version of the national access point, which the EU in its wisdom a couple of years ago said we need, and the DFT in genuine wisdom said, despite leaving the EU, Yes, we agree, we need. So there will be eventually, um, might be slightly overselling what this will not be, but it will eventually be a single point where all transport data can be found. It won't actually be there. It'll probably be a signpost because a lot of it will be paid for. So it'll be, you go into one place, it tells you where to go, where you then need to whip your credit card out to buy it. There are issues around the actual data of the individual company or the individual passenger, where you're going to, what you want to do, because that becomes personal data and that's a little bit tricky. Now, Google knows this, all this shit. We all know that Google knows this because Google tells me where I'm going half the time. Um, so there's actually nothing stopping us from harvesting that data. We just need to think carefully about whether we want to. I think that's more a question to society. Do we really want everybody to know where everybody's going all the time, or is that an infringement in, in our own, all of our privacy? But having a centralized database of data is relatively straightforward and will happen over the next couple of years. Any addition? I mean, the thoughts that come into my head is what do you actually define as transport data? Especially when we're coming to in my, my area, which is decarbonization, different energy vectors coming into play, and those energy vectors are demanded by different sectors, transport, industry, consumer, residential. So where do we place the boundaries on this transport data when all of that information feeds into this system and can benefit this system? I've got two questions. First one, I guess, is really from Hugh, and the second one's probably for Graham. And they're both connected, and possibly other panel members have a view as well. Graham mentioned uh, in his presentation 25% of uh, air quality issues are caused by road freight. Uh, Euro 6 trucks are the cleanest trucks on the planet. 51% of the HGV fleet is currently Euro 6. By 2022, the N3 fleet will be 75% virtually Euro 6. And one of the big problems we've got is the way that it's being portrayed. Actually, road freight accounts for 5% of emissions. So I'd be interested to know the background on that, which then links into the next one, which deals with enforcement issues like CAS and the weight restrictions Graham was talking about earlier. And essentially, the CAS at the moment, the RHA considers that the DEFRA policy is actually defective. In the Coventry have now decided they're not going to go ahead with their CAS. Other local authorities have a real problem with trying to put the CAS in place. Now, every city that charges £100, operators make 1% profit, is going to be wiped out. So that cost is going to be passed on. So again, schemes like Graham's, and I'm dealing with other local authorities on a daily basis looking at restrictions, and very often we can come to a solution, a method to work out a way forward. But the enforcement costs money. The police and local authorities already have, we believe, sufficient powers to be able to do that enforcement. So it's probably more than two questions in there, but I'd be very interested in your views on those two subjects, please. I'll deal with the first part of that, which was the emissions. Yes. We're cleaning up the emissions of existing technology, what I call the incumbent technology. 
And I think that incumbent technology has a role to play going forward. But to meet these challenging targets of decarbonization requires a degree of electrification. And the question is, going forward, in terms of electrification, you can target the passenger car transport fleet, but the growing sector is the freight transport. And there are certainly cases within the freight transport area where electrification is a suitable technology at this point in time. If that technology improves, and if the internal combustion engine technology um, is basically pushed out ever so slightly, then basically more cases of electrification come up. So I can see, yeah, continue with the current trajectory of improving, but in order to meet, electrification will be part of that. And I think we'll have a mixed fleet. And I think that going forward, you may basically find different freight mod, um, sort of business models that open up opportunities for increasing electrification going forward. I don't know if that answers the sort of question that you had. Well, I, I think our small, I totally agree with you. It, it's a long, it's a long time. Well, this is where I come into sort of business models problem because there's three different categories of truck. I mean, they basically align to the end categorization. And the long distance between um, urban areas to, to, to freight centers is, is one thing. And we talk about last mile, and last mile in cities is basically more suitable for basically existing wide van fleet, but even more emerging modalities like um, um, much smaller freight um, vehicles. The question is, does the economics stack up? You've got to change your uh, modality at certain points. So we call them uh, 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 centers, distribution centers. And these distribution centers need to be heavily utilized to make the economics add up. Unfortunately, at the moment, we've got a very privatized freight sector, which basically the back office functionality for individual freight operators is very different and therefore the sh the, 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 they don't each want to operate their own sort of center where they move from one modality to another modality. So in order to make these freight, these centers work, I think we have to have shared centers to enable greater access to last mile. How do we make these shared centers work? We have to basically have more alignment between the back office business operations of different operators. And that becomes the data sharing again when this is confidential business information, how would you make that work? So I, so I'll probably just add in a nutshell, we're seeing government um, reverse a lot of the beaching cuts um, to the rail system. And I think the vision or one potential vision uh, we should be aspiring for is the way that um, rail, which a lot of it is already electrified, can do that 100, 200 kil kilometer trunk haul. Um, more SF strategic welfare interchanges and terminals, it unloads, and then you have an electrified um, last mile um, HGV um, uh, road network system which then uh, delivers goods to point of delivery. And I think there, there, is, there is already a, uh, an option there to do that. It's a, a lot of the, um, network, the rail network is already electrified, um, so that would be my, um, my view on that. Graham, did you want to talk through um, TLROs and enforcement. Um, let me just uh, talk around last mile first. The, when we did the study on the, the area, we looked at HGVs as being uh, a big factor of that and how we move the HGVs out of the area. And I'm mindful that the, the, the prevalence of Euro 6 means that the emissions from the Euro 6 vehicles is is a lot less than, than, than people imagine. And, and people view big trucks as being the devil. Whereas we also looked at the number of smaller van-like commercial vehicles in the area at the same time. And, and they were something like six times as many as the HGVs in the area. And very, very few of them met any emission standards. So when, when people were saying, oh, I don't want any trucks in the area, they didn't consider the fact that everything they bought arrived on a truck. Uh, and, and, and more often than not, on more than one truck. 
but, but the, the actual vans that were doing that last mile delivery were the real polluters. And it, naively, it seems to me that as a local authority, we have an obligation to look at that last mile delivery as part of our planning process. It's fine to go and build a, an estate, a housing estate of four, five thousand, ten thousand houses, but you should be looking at how you manage the the last mile delivery as part of that planning process. And it it seems like there is an opportunity as part of the development to build in a community space and utilize electric vehicles to service the estate. Fewer vehicles, no emissions, seems far more efficient and far more attractive a proposition uh, in terms of that last mile delivery. Having said that, the use of urban consolidation points is, is great in central London where you have uh, sufficient demand uh, in, in Aylesbury or High Wycombe. Maybe not so much so. So there is some financial balancing that needs to take place in order to be, for that to become a reality. But I do believe it will happen. At some point, it will have to. Uh, the other question you were on about was the, uh, the, 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 the TRO process itself and the enforcement question. F for me, um, it's not about enforcement. It's about getting the trucks onto the right roads and, and not having accidents every day in villages where trucks simply can't get through, uh, where the roads weren't built for big trucks, where the bridges can't take the big trucks. It's not about enforcement, it's about being more efficient. And I'm mindful, of course, that that additional few miles that we're asking those, that's those through traffic to drive adds cost to the business which, as you say, does get passed on to the consumer. I, I'd like to say they're not my trucks. I can't. I'm, I'm interested in local businesses and I have to support local businesses. The trucks that are passing through are not local business as such and I can get away with saying they need to do that extra couple of miles. Just very quickly, I'll probably just add, because you made the point about LGVs, is that, you know, I think everybody here is pro-freight um, as a consumer and as a policymaker, or whatever we do, no doubt about it. Uh, I've sat in many parish council village halls being bashed around about 44-tonne lorries going through their village or parish and been making the case that, well, it's, it's not there because it wants to be there, it's delivering something. Um, so I get that. And I think in that vein, we must be aware or, or must air some caution to the fact that we don't want to be over-regulating um, our, our big arctics, our 44 tonners, and then inadvertently meaning that everybody is then getting into LGVs to dodge those regulations and jumping in a, a you, know, b b you know, anyone can quite literally go out there, get, you know, get, get, a, get a white van, and become a haulier and, and take it to France if they so wish. And I think that's what we're seeing, this, this, this exponential rise in LGVs, and we just need to play some caution to, to, to how we approach that, I think. Um, Paul Darlow, Portsmouth City Council. Um, we have an interesting um, freight model in Portsmouth because we've got local freight and we've also got the international freight and the freight going um, through the city centre to the Isle of Wight. Um, and we see a variety of different operating models. Um, I do wonder whether there's some kind of scope. I know we've talked a lot about mobility as a service. I wonder if there's some opportunity for freight as a service, because remember, the value is in the goods, not in the vehicles that are actually moving it. And I think um, in terms of business models and uh, enabling to licensed carriers in certain areas, so potentially you could say in an inner city, actually only people that are licensed to move that freight um, in that last mile, last five miles. I mean, certainly on our Channel Islands run, we see a massive amount of trailer freight. It's not truck and trailer. The trucks get dropped at a number of distribution points and then they're shuttled in. Now, it's much easier to work with those operators in terms of low emissions um, than everyone else that might be coming in and out. I would actually go 
one step further and say there is no difference between mobility of service and failure of service. It should be integrated. There's no reason why when I get into an Uber, there can be a parcel next to me, apart from the fact I don't get into an Uber. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't share journeys between people and freight. I think freight as a service makes perfect sense. I suspect the freight industry would hate you for it because it would ruin them as, as mobility as a service will disrupt the rest of transport, which is, but it probably will happen, yes. Probably through Amazon. As, it's, a good, it's a good point, Paul. Um, I think I wonder if there's a, you know opportunity for local authorities like yourself to start to determine some policy objectives around it. Um, I know this is uh, going back a few years, but I was uh, uh, quite fortunate to work on the, uh, the London 2012 Olympics. And as my role was in city operations, so integrating city plans around transport with the, uh, with the plans of the, uh, the organizing committee. I had the uh, slightly, uh, I say envious job of having to go to, uh, to Westfield, the, uh, the, sort of the, the shopping center on the edge of the Olympic Park and turn around and say, by the way, you can't have two and a half thousand vehicles coming deliver 24/7 to resupply your, um, you know, all of your uh, all of your clients um, during the games. For security reasons, you have a four-hour resupply window in the middle of the night. What are you going to do about it? Um, and they worked with their supplier, DHL, consolidation centre outside in Barking. Everyone had to drive there, get their, you know, get their goods scanned and make sure materially screened to make sure they weren't going to go bang when they got in a lorry and then came back in. Now, I know that was an exceptional case, and it's probably not a business case that, I dare say, you know, hauliers and, uh, and the Fresh Hospital Association and road haulage guys would really like because of the margins. But it was about sitting there saying, actually, for a specific reason and for, for a good benefit, there was a reason why we were doing that, and we shouldn't lose sight of the consolidation because it really works. It you know, allowed them to, uh, to pick that up. But again, it's probably that business model. There may have been a use case for it, but is there a real business case for it? It's, it's a challenge, and I think for, for yourself, it's a, probably, a, as you say, it's a, it's a challenge, but I think there's, a, there's probably a way through it. Um, but to Ron's point, is that moving people and goods shouldn't really be anything different. It should be an integrated service, but that's, again, trying to unpick many years' worth of uh, industrial partnerships and other things. Um, the, the, the Isle of Wight uh, is, is very much like the Scottish islands. The, the, the volume of business is such that it actually costs the operators more to deliver it themselves than it does to hand it over to somebody else to do it. So that's, that's the benefit they get from using that common carrier is, is the, the, redu the reduction in the operating costs. And the problem with mainland is that unless you can give them a significant benefit, be it financial, they're not going to carry the risk of, of the commercial risk or, or the brand risk. There has to be a, a benefit that will outweigh that in order for them to collaborate. And I'm not sure that we have a, a market which will support that. I'd like to think we do. But I'm not sure we do. Easy, it is easier on when you get to the islands. Uh, the National Infrastructure Commission about three or four years ago talked about road pricing. Do we think road pricing is inevitable? I seem to be the one that picks up the mic whenever somebody asks a difficult question. Um, first of all, do I dare to say this on behalf of my company? Probably not. On a personal note, yes, I think it is inevitable. Be mainly because of the, well, first of all, the, the change from transport to mobility service or freight or service or whatever it is, which is a different business model which needs to be differently taxed. And combine that with the fact that the government is going to shoot themselves in the foot and getting rid of, of vehicle excess duty. And we're going to need to recover that tax base some other way. Road pricing is not the only way, but it is, the, I, I'm guessing it's the most likely way. I suspect it's going to be framed slightly differently. They're going to avoid calling in that because it's politically toxic. But it will be something very similar. I wouldn't put that down as a catapult opinion that this is a, a run or an opinion. Anybody else? <laughs> 
Uh, interesting that um, I think because as we're all moving towards a sort of uh, you know monthly monthly rental of everything else we're doing, so the bundling in mobile phones, etc., rather than purchasing stuff outright, PCPs in uh, you know private vehicles. I think the the move towards something different, as Ron said, rather than called road pricing, but some pay as you go or pay as you use something um, within the in the road space is probably something that's going to come sooner rather than later in, in certain areas. I think um, London particularly might be one of the early adopters of that. And I think there's a, a Centre for London report that's coming out in, uh, in March um, that mentions something very similar as a, as a recommendation as the way you can move the business model from current to doing that. Now, I appreciate that probably won't be the right model for everywhere in the in the country, or even um, even all parts of London. But I think the uh, it's it's likely there will be some element of that that's that's on its way, especially with uh, with you know electric electric vehicles and um, and autonomous vehicles further into the future. But I think that's probably uh, on its way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Just a further reflection on that, um, one of the ch interesting things around uh, a move to road pricing will be the relationship between central government and local government. What is the role of uh, a local highway authority? Um, you know, we, we feel that the um, move towards automation fundamentally changes the relationship between road user and road authority. It gives road authorities much greater relevance, particularly with active traffic management, the ability to route different classes of vehicles, um, through different parts of their network. Um, but uh, a road pricing strategy implies a very centralized approach. Um, so that, that would um, involve a big change between uh, local sovereignty and, and, and central government. I'm going to steer clear of that. <laughs> um, it is a tricky question. Um, so I'll give a personal view rather than an EEH view. <laughs> I think yes, road pricing or whatever, we're, demand management, whatever we're going to call it, um, there's, it will happen. But again, I, I almost sympathize a bit with the, the freight community on this one because they pay, I mean, if the Freight Transport Association reports uh, anything to go by, there's a lot of levies that they pay and, and there's a lot of contribution that they make to road infrastructure uh, and maintenance. and. Um, and I, again, personal view, but I feel that if you're moving a load of track ballast around, um, there's not many ways you can do it. I know that you know these, these last mile deliveries equate to probably 1% in inner urban areas, but you kind of need to stick that on a lorry. And whereas from the transport user, sometimes I do have a choice about how I move around the city or town. Um, so I think just caution that we're not sort of disproportionately discriminating against an industry which quite often doesn't have another way around it. Um, uh, again, that's just a reflection rather than anything else. Um, just sort of bringing the data back into TDI, I was, I was sort of amused um, by a discrepancy between uh, two of the presentations. I think uh, possibly Alex and Toby's actually. Um, just around, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm referring to my phone because I took a photo of the slides, but one of you quoted the cost of congestion to the UK economy at 7.9 billion, I think it was Toby, and uh, Alex had a figure of something very much larger, 37 billion. And it just perfectly illustrates the, the paucity of data and the inconsistency of the way we try and measure the problems we're trying to solve. And uh, so I wasn't really meaning to put you on the spot, but funnily enough, I think I also had a stat in a version of my slides uh, which I didn't show, and I, I wasn't able to retrieve what that number was, but it would almost certainly have been wildly different from, from your two, because it came from a different source again. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we're not even able to measure the problems that we're trying to solve, um, and, and there is a much, uh, the, the, there's just a huge need in this industry for better data, and also greater consistency in the way we uh, measure it, measure things, measure the problem, if you like. Sure. Yeah, uh, Glenn Marinas from Cordon. Uh, question on the, the way we interpret uh, the, the movement of goods and freight and logistics. Should we be including the movement of people as in public transportation 
within the, 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 the conversation and the agenda or is it a separate discussion? Yeah, so I'll go again. It's the same comment I just made. In many ways, people and goods are the same things. I mean, don't start sticking people in refrigerated lorries because they'll be upset. Um, but if you're thinking about it not being a systems engineer, I'll happily put the, the hat on. If you think about it as, from a systems engineer's perspective, it is just shifting smaller bodies within bigger bodies around. Do I care whether it's a human or parcel? It needs to go from A to B with the least amount of carbon and least amount of cost. Preferably without killing them if they're a person or breaking them if they're a parcel. But we should be considering them the same. And in many ways, a bus is just an, an LGV, isn't it? Anything technically that works on a small truck probably works on the bus. It doesn't do the same routes, and the, the, obviously there's some, there are some differences, but in, they are in many ways very, very similar, and we should stop that dichotomy between freight and people as, as much as we can. From a curbside management perspective, yeah, anything that moves around that sort of curbside management, whether it is freight or bus, passenger, any sort of vehicle, probably doesn't make a great deal of difference for us. It's about making sure there's efficient use of that space and efficient use of that curbside. Um, so, yeah, I don't really see any, any real difference in that, you know, in that sort of space. From a purely curbside management space, it's just about getting that efficient use through a, through a city, town, you know, across the, across the country space. <laughs>